So we were talking about this little dance that chromosomes go through and we call that dance mitosis. And if you uh, check on Blackboard, uh, in addition to uh, notes from the last time, uh, I posted a link. I posted a link to a um, time lapse video of what this looks like. We talked about the different stages in mitosis, and it's important to remember that those stages flow into each other, uh, much like the steps of a dance. And here's the thing, at the start of mitosis, each chromosome consists of two parallel strands that are stuck together in the middle. <coughs> and those strands are called chromatids. Uh, we used to do a lab where we would have students kind of do a little mitosis puppet show uh, with pipe cleaners. And you could think of a chromatid or a chromosome at this stage as looking like two pipe cleaners twisted together in the middle, or each pipe cleaner would be a chromatid. Now the chromosomes appear in prophase, they line up in the middle at metaphase, the centromere breaks and the separate chromatids move to opposite sides of the cell, that's anaphase. And then at the end, uh, two new nuclei form, which is telophase, and usually at the same time as telophase, the entire cell divides in two, which is called cytokinesis. Mitosis is technically the stages of nucleus division. Usually a cell divides when its nucleus does, but there are cases where it doesn't and you can end up with cells with multiple nuclei. It does happen. So when we can see chromosomes, when they become visible in prophase, each chromosome consists of two chromatids. At the end of the process, at telophase, where we lose the ability to see chromosomes, each one consists of one chromatid. But if you were to take a freshly divided pair of cells, and just let them grow, give them you know, a nutrient broth or something like that, and just watch them until they started dividing again, each of those cells would have two chromatids per chromosome. So somewhere we can't see it during interphase, each chromosome somehow sprouts a new chromatid. And so we now divide the life cycle of a cell into what we call the cell cycle. Uh, mitosis is, of course, when the nucleus divides. Typically, most of a cell's life is spent in interphase. Um, exactly how long the cell uh, takes depends on- Do you want me to help you with that recruiting stuff that you talked to me about uh, a few days ago? Uh, Jared, cut your mic, would you? After my class, I'll help you if you, if you want. And just let me know what you want me to do for you. You're welcome. All right. Jared, if you could cut your mic. All right. Okay. So we divide a cell's life life cycle. We now call this the cell cycle. Um, typically, most of the time, um, a cell is in interphase. A rough average length of time for this whole thing to take might be about 24 hours, but it all depends on the type of cell. So a cell will divide in mitosis, and then the new uh, cells enter a stage that we call G1, uh, G standing for growth, and that's when the cell just grows, it takes in food, it does its metabolism thing, it talks on its cell phone. <laughs> uh, it just, you know, does what it does. Uh, the S phase is when the cell creates new chromatids. We can't yet see how it does it uh, because in interphase, the chromosomes aren't visible as separate 
uh, units. Um, and we will talk later as to why we can't see them uh, once I've covered a little bit more ground. For right now, you just need to know that they're there, but we can't make them out during interphase. So in the G1 phase, the cell just grows and does its thing. In the S phase, S standing for synth synthesis, come on, Wagoner, the cell creates new chromatids on each of its chromosomes. And then after that, in a stage called G2, uh, the cell might grow some more and it gets ready for mitosis to take place. Oh no, I'm in class. Yeah. Uh, Morgan, could you cut your mic? Okay. And then in G2, the cell grows some more and gets ready for mitosis. Uh, how long these stages take depend on the cell. Uh, some, like uh, the neurons in your brain, uh, actually stop the cycle, uh, usually at G1, and don't do any of this. Uh, that's why active nerve cells in your brain, once they die, uh, can't be replaced. Although, as we learned at the very beginning, we now know there are parts of the brain where you can build new nerve cells. Um, I've seen some cells where G2 lasts maybe a minute. Um, I've seen cells where G2 might last for years. Uh, it all depends on what type of cell it is. Uh, so the, the lengths of these pieces of the circle are, don't necessarily signify accurate lengths of time. Uh, the lengths vary a lot. But that's how we diagram a cell's life cycle. And the context in which you encounter this are things like single-celled eukaryotes reproduced by mitosis. Uh, you get more amoebas or more green pond scum by mitosis. And then it is through mitosis that development happens, uh, which just means everything between a fertilized egg and an adult. Somebody tell Jared to mute uh, his mic, please. Uh, you got from a single fertilized egg in your mama's uterus all the way to the find up standing young adult that you are by an awful lot of mitosis. That's how you got from one cell uh, to roughly 37 trillion cells, lots and lots of mitosis. There's also the fact that somewhere between 50 and 70 billion cells in your body die every day. Uh, usually this is completely expected. Uh, for example, the cells that make up the lining of your uh, intestines, they're constantly exposed to the harsh uh, chemicals and enzymes that you use to break down food. Uh, so those are constantly wearing out and getting sloughed off and ultimately passing out in your feces. And they're constantly being replaced by new cells that are produced by cell division. Uh, the cells that make up the cornea of your eye. Uh, the cornea is what you stick the contact lens on if you wear contacts. Those are constantly dying and getting flushed away in your tears and replaced by new cells. Um, the outermost layer of your skin is made of dead cells that constantly flake off. Uh, this is what dandruff is. And so every day you have to replace uh, cells in your body. Um, somebody actually calculated that the number of cells that you, that you lose each year is roughly equivalent to your own body weight. So you make a whole new body's worth of cells every year of your life, which is kind of a neat fact to trot out at parties. Uh, mitosis is important in repairing damage, um, repair of wounds. If you get a cut on your skin, uh, mitosis is what makes the new cells uh, that grow together and end up sealing off the cut. And then we're probably not going to have time to talk about this, but 
cells control when they go into mitosis by various control mechanisms. When cells in your body lose control, like losing the brakes in a car, and they start dividing out of control, you've got cancer. Cancer is basically mitosis with a stuck accelerator and broken brakes. Um, your cells have got various mechanisms built in uh, to keep them from going off the rails, but sometimes those mechanisms can fail. Uh, we probably won't have time to look more closely into what those are, uh, but uh, that's the fundamental definition of cancer, mitosis that you can't stop. Okay, so you thought mitosis was bad. It gets considerably worse because we now know there's a second type of cell division that cells go through, and it's called dun, 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 meiosis. Not mitosis, it's meiosis. It's like it was so cold a couple of weeks ago that not only mitosis is cold, but my S is cold. Uh, never mind. Sorry, I can't really make a good joke about that one. Right. And we need, meiosis is kind of a pain in the neck to learn, but we need to get through it because it's an important part of the scaffolding I'm trying to build here. It's an important piece in the jigsaw puzzle. And you have to remember that chromosomes inside a cell are not all identical. We can actually take cells from certain parts of your body and kind of squish them and stain them. And we could take pictures of your chromosomes. In fact, there are you know, medical professionals that, uh, that do this uh, routinely because you can diagnose certain conditions that way. And if you do this, what you find is that not all chromosomes in a cell are the same. Some are long, some are short, some have the centromere close to the physical center. Uh, that's called being a centric chromosome. Sometimes the centromere is off center and we call those acentric chromosomes. And then if you use certain stains on chromosomes, they don't just look like strips of yarn, they've actually got stripes or bands on them. And chromosomes differ in the pattern of bands on each one, um, which again, you would not see with an ordinary light microscopy, but you can make out the bands with special staining techniques. And it turns out that in a typical eukaryotic cell, there are two of each types of chromosomes. You can sort out chromosomes by size and shape and banding pattern, and it turns out they come in pairs. And a cell that has two of each type of chromosome has a name, we call that a diploid cell. Most of the cells in your body are diploid. They've got two of each chromosome type. So those are the chromosomes from a normal human female, and these happen to have been stained with a fluorescent stain, uh, where different parts of each chromosome uh, fluoresce as either orange or yellow. Uh, you can see where, if you look carefully, you can spot where the centromeres are. In chromosome one at the upper left, uh, the centromere is that slightly red area right in the center uh, you can see there's a uh, kind of dark division between the chromatids, but right there in the middle, there's none of that dividing line. That's the centromere. And you can see that the bands of yellow and orange uh, match up between chromosome, between the two chromosome one. And then chromosome two is only a little shorter and chromosome three is a little shorter and we go down all the way to the smallest ones, chromosome 22. And then there's a pair of big chromosomes called the X chromosomes. And we'll talk a little bit later as to what those do. Uh, those have to do with sex determination. And we'll talk about sex chromosomes later. For right now, you just need to see that we can sort 
chromosomes into 23 pairs. You with me there so far? Different animal and plant species have different chromosome numbers. This happens to be chromosomes of mice. Uh, and there's 20 pairs, uh, 40 chromosomes in all. Um, and I think I mentioned some, I think horses have 64 chromosomes that come in 32 pairs. Uh, fruit flies have eight chromosomes, that makes four pairs. Um, the number's not really important. Usually you do have closely related organisms with similar chromosome numbers. Uh, chimpanzees, for example, have 48 chromosomes. We've got 46. Aside from that, there's no simple relationship between the complexity of an organism and the number of chromosomes it's got. Uh, the record holder is a tiny little fern uh, that you could step on and never realize it was there. Uh, it's called genus Ophioglossum, uh, the adder's tongue fern. And it's got 1,260 chromosomes in each cell, making up 630 pairs. Um, but that's really just trivia. Uh, the number is just a number. Uh, for our purposes here, there's nothing particularly interesting about the number. It just is a number. The big exception to the rule that eukaryotic cells are diploid is that animals, plants, many other eukaryotes form specialized cells called gametes, and those are used in sexual reproduction. In some protists, uh, a lot of seaweeds are an example. Uh, also in fungi, uh, all of the gametes are the same size, and we have no way of dividing them into eggs and sperm. They look identical to each other. Um, in this case, we might call different types of gamete plus and minus. Uh, sometimes they're called A and alpha or something like that. Uh, but certainly in animals and plants, uh, the gametes are not the same size and they come in two forms, big and small. Uh, the big ones we call eggs and the small ones we call sperm. I take it you've heard of those. And what makes gametes special is they only have one of each pair of chromosomes. And what we call this is being haploid. So a haploid cell has only one of each pair of chromosomes. Diploids have two of each pair. So the chromosomes in a human egg cell would look like this, except you would delete one of each uh, each pair, and you'd have 23 chromosomes, not 46. So mentally imagine erasing one of each pair, and you'd get what the chromosomes in an egg cell would look like. The specialized process of cell division that produces... Can you go back? You there? Can you go back? Uh, sure. All right. Okay, so gametes in animals and plants come in large and small forms called eggs and sperm. Um, the individuals that make eggs we call females, the individuals that make sperm we call both, uh, sorry, we call males. Um, in a surprisingly large number of organisms uh, might make both, and we call those hermaphrodites. Uh, earthworms and slugs, for example, uh, make both eggs and sperm. Uh, so when they mate, each one is a sperm giver as well as a sperm receiver. Um, there's quite a number of fish uh, that actually switch. Um, clownfish, for example, like the star of Finding Nemo. You remember clownfish? Uh, clownfish will live together with a, uh, a mated pair of a male and a female, and then some young, immature males uh, that, have, uh, that have moved in. 
and they live in these groups until the female dies. And when that happens, the male switches to a female. Uh, and one of the immature males takes over to become the next uh, mature male. Uh, so if Finding Nemo was realistic, Marlin would be trying to raise Nemo while at the same time transitioning to Marlena. Uh, that's just the way that, that nature works. And, you know, I wish Pixar had called me up and asked. My consulting fees are quite reasonable. Um, I think they had a chance to make a much more realistic movie that way. Um, right. Anyway, uh, in animals, eggs and sperm are produced by meiosis. Uh, the places where meiosis go on are your ovaries or your testes. In very, very rare individuals, both. But I presume most people listening to this have one or the other. And that's the only place where meiosis happens. With plants, things are a little bit weird. Maybe we can talk about that later. Probably won't have time. Uh, but certainly in animals, you make eggs and sperm by meiosis. And the basis were worked out in 1883 uh, by a Belgian guy named Van Beneden, uh, who was studying intestinal roundworms, uh, these parasites that can live in the human intestine in such great numbers, they can literally block it. Uh, well, it turned out he was making some studies of intestinal worms and happened to see meiosis for the first time. Uh, you'll also see this called reduction division because unlike mitosis, meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes per cell uh, by one half. All right, so here's a human egg cell uh, that's been swarmed by a sizable number of human sperm cells, uh, one of which will manage to penetrate uh, the outside of the egg. And that one lucky sperm cell's nucleus will join with the egg cell's nucleus. And then we have a fertilized egg, or as it's called, a zygote. I think that term's on the next slide, Z-Y-G-O-T-E, zygote. Uh, the egg cell's got a nucleus with one of each pair, or 23. The sperm cell contains one of each pair. Uh, that head of the sperm cell is a small nucleus and not much else. Uh, and in each sperm cell, there are one of each pair of human chromosomes, 23. And with Mr. Sperm and Mrs. Egg's nuclei joined together, we create a new nucleus that has two of each pair, 46 chromosomes, one of each pair from mom, and one of each pair from dad. And this is what it looks like. That is a fertilized human egg. Um, the outer stuff is a barrier to keep more than one sperm from fertilizing the egg at the same time. Uh, the egg cell itself is mostly round, and in the center, you can see two nuclei that are starting to fuse. This is a human zygote, um, a fertilized egg, and that new nucleus that is forming as the egg and the sperm nuclei fuse will have two of each chromosome, 46 chromosomes. Of each of your chromosomes, remember, your chromosomes come in pairs. You got one of each chromosome from mom and one of each chromosome from dad. And if you have children, you will pass on one of each of your chromosome pairs to each one of your kids. This ought to be making you think. Mendel had already worked out that genes come in pairs and one of each pair gets passed on to each offspring, right? Once von Beneden had worked out how meiosis worked, you could see that the same rules apply to chromosomes. You got one of each pair of chromosomes from each of your parents and you will pass on one of each pair of chromosomes to each of your children if you have any. So genes work in this way. Chromosomes turn out to work in the same way. Huh, 
maybe there's some kind of link between genes and chromosomes. Hmm. We'll look at that link next week. But one consequence of this is when you're making eggs or sperm, you have to divide the chromosomes evenly. You've got to have one of each pair in each egg or each sperm. And so the whole point of the process of meiosis is to make sure that those chromosomes are divided evenly, uh, to make sure that every egg and every sperm has only one of every pair of chromosomes. The problem is that this can sometimes go wrong. Uh, meiosis is very, very good at dividing chromosomes evenly, but it's not perfect. And if there's an error, an egg or a sperm can end up either missing one of the chromosomes or it can have an extra copy. These, what you're looking at here, are the chromosomes of somebody who has two of each of his chromosomes. You can see two of one, two of chromosome two, two of chromosome three, two of chromosome four, dot, 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 all the way until you get down to chromosome 21. Okay, I think that red box is supposed to stick around for longer than it is. There we go. Look at chromosome 21 down at the bottom center. That person got two copies of chromosome 21 from one parent, doesn't matter which, and one copy of chromosome 21 from the other parent. Most of the time when this happens, uh, a fertilized egg is so messed up that it cannot develop any further. Uh, if a fertilized egg has three copies of chromosome number one, uh, it typically will not be able to uh, develop for very long. And in the case of humans, it will miscarry quite possibly before a woman is even aware uh, that she had a fertilized egg in her body at all. Uh, in fact, something on the order, of something between 25 and 50% of all human conceptions, all human fertilized eggs, never develop at all. Um, and they miscarry often before the woman's aware that anything has happened. But you can develop uh, an embryo with three copies of chromosome 21 and such embryos develop into fetuses and then into babies. Um, babies with three copies of chromosome 21 have what's called Down syndrome, uh, various physical problems like an enlarged intestine, uh, enlarged heart, uh, increased risk of heart defects, uh, and of course, intelligence is usually uh, lowered. Um, I am assuming that you've seen people with Down syndrome before. This is why they have it. Either their mother or their father, it doesn't matter which, just happened to produce an egg or a sperm cell uh, that instead of one of each chromosome carried one of most chromosomes, but two copies of chromosome number 21. Um, and that's just... Like I said, meiosis is very, very good, but it's not perfect. Uh, every so often, this is just one of those things that happens. You will very rarely see babies that are born with three copies of chromosome 13 or three copies of chromosome 18. Usually, they don't live very long after birth. Uh, usually, they might live weeks, maybe months. Uh, occasionally they might make it longer than that, but the outlook is not very good. And then most of the time, fertilized eggs with three copies of a chromosome never produce a baby at all. Anyway, so that's a context in what you might have encountered meiosis before. I'm not going to make you memorize every stage of meiosis Here's what you basically need to know, that meiosis is actually a double division. You start with one cell, 
and it divides and then it divides again. So right now, guys, in your seminiferous tubules in your testes, you've got cells called spermatogonia that are, um, you make more spermatogonia by mitosis, but every day some of your spermatogonia switch over to dividing by meiosis, and each one divides twice, and each one produces four sperm cells, right? Divide into two, divide again, and the two become four. Okay, yeah, shout out to the, uh, yeah, shout out to the testicles. As I like to tell my students in this class, I am the tester. And what does that make you? The testes, ha ha ha. Um, women in the class, it's a little bit different uh, because in you, meiosis is uneven. And instead of starting with one oogonium cell and producing four eggs, uh, you produce, first of all, you, uh, they divide unevenly. So for every starter cell, you produce one egg cell and a few tiny little cast off things called polar bodies. Uh, because in that case, meiosis doesn't divide the cell evenly. Uh, at every division, one cell gets all of the contents and the other one gets almost nothing, uh, unequal cell division. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the process of meiosis begins when you're in your mama and then halts and doesn't start up until usually one cell matures, finishes meiosis, and is released from your ovaries roughly once every month. Um, whereas in men, well, in male animals in general, sperm production is continuous uh, from puberty pretty much all the way till death, as far as I know. It, it might slow down a bit, but I don't think it normally uh, completely stops unless you have some kind of condition that makes you infertile, but that's another story. So it's a little bit different for producing eggs and, and sperm. I'll try to give you a general overview of how it happens. Before meiosis, a cell goes through G1, S, and then G2. And when meiosis starts, the cell has two of each chromosome, and each chromosome has two chromatids. In the first division, meiosis 1, one of each pair of chromosomes goes to each daughter cell. So you go from two of each chromosome, two chromatids per chromosome. And then after meiosis one, you have one of each chromosome, but two chromatids per chromosome. And then in the second division, meiosis two, each chromosome breaks apart at the centromere and one chromatid goes to each daughter cell. Meiosis II looks just like mitosis. Uh, in mitosis, it doesn't really matter. You know, each chromosome divides independently and it doesn't really matter whether they come in pairs or not. So here's what you need to keep track of. Before meiosis, Every spermatogonium in your testes or oogonium in your ovaries, depending, is a single cell. It contains two of each chromosome, and it contains two chromatids per chromosome. And then it divides. We call that division meiosis one, and you end up with two cells. Each cell contains one of each chromosome, and each chromosome is made of two chromatids. And then at the end of meiosis two, the second division, you have four cells. Well, technically you have four cells if it's sperm you're making. If it's eggs, you have one cell and a couple of little dinky things that you throw out called the polar bodies. 
So slight difference there that I'm not going to hold you responsible for. Uh, but the egg or sperm contains one of each chromosome, and each chromosome carries only one chromatid. That's why meiosis is sometimes called reduction division. Uh, you're dividing the number of chromosomes in half at the end of meiosis two. I'll show you a few pictures. Meiosis one consists of prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. And meiosis two consists of prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two. I'm not gonna go over every one of those stages in agonizing detail. These happen to be pictures taken from uh, flower anthers, the organs where they make pollen. A little bit easier to get a hold of those than to get hold of testes. Ow, ouch. Um, and in prophase one, the chromosomes condense and become visible. Uh, on the left, that's early prophase one, and you can see the chromosomes, but they look kind of stringy. Uh, by late prophase one, the chromosomes look a lot more thick uh, and a lot more distinct. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Over there on the right, those chromosomes, they are thick with two Cs. Never mind. Okay. But there's a difference, and you need to be aware of this difference. At the beginning of meiosis one, and only in meiosis one, each chromosome pairs up with the other member of its pair. This doesn't happen in mitosis. It happens only in meiosis one. Each chromosome pairs together with members of the other pair. Uh, what you're looking at here are chromosomes in meiosis one. Uh, that have paired up, uh, creating these structures that look, there's one that looks kind of like an X uh, close to the center. Uh, there's one, that's a pair of chromosomes that's actually touching twice, so it looks kind of like a cartoon of a fish over on the left. Uh, there's another pair that's that little figure eight kind of thing down below. Each one of these lumps is a pair of two chromosomes that are stuck together. And they're not only stuck together, but they undergo something called crossing over. Uh, each paired up chromosome breaks and the pieces rejoin. So each chromosome breaks off a piece and gains a piece from the other chromosome of its pair. Don't know if I'm describing that perfectly well, uh, but it's called crossing over. This is a view of two of a pair of chromosomes uh, where each of the chromatids are breaking and rejoining with chromatids from the other pair. I used to model this by getting somebody to stand next to me and saying, imagine we stand close together and we cross our arms and then our arms break and reattach so that I end up with your arm and you end up with mine. Uh, that's kind of a weird Frankenstein way of thinking about it, but that is what happens here. The paired up chromosomes break and exchange equivalent pieces. Anyway, after that pairing up is done, that pairing up and that crossing over, Meiosis ends with the formation of two haploid cells because one of each chromosome moves to each daughter cell. This is what meiosis one looks like. And then meiosis two is a repeat of meiosis. The chromosomes appear again. They line up in the middle again. That's metaphase. They separate and move to opposite ends of the cell. This would be anaphase two. And we end up with four haploid cells. That's what it looks like in lily anthers. Um, absent a few details, that's what it looks like in your testes if you've got them. Okay, I've got a request to go back. Um, which one do you need me to go back to? Because that was the last slide. Okay, go back to both. Um, okay, meiosis, 
uh, you start with one cell, two of each chromosome, two chromatids per. At the end of meiosis one, you've got one of each chromosome. I was talking about the, the last two. Oh, the last uh, two. Okay. The last slide. All right. Yeah, yes, sir. So prophase one, the chromosomes become visible. The chromosomes pair up. There's actually stages of the pairing up, but I'm not going to make you memorize leptotene, zygotene, pacotene, and diakinesis unless you want to. There's that crossing over that happens. Meiosis one ends with two haploid cells because one of each pair moves to each daughter cell. And because of crossing over, that means that, put it this way, you got one of each chromosome from mom and one of each chromosome from dad. When you make eggs or sperm, the chromosomes undergo crossing over and then go on to be chromosomes in an egg or a sperm, which means that if you have kids, each chromosome that you pass to your kids is actually a cut and paste of the chromosomes that you got from your mom and the chromosomes that you got from your dad. Each one of your kids' chromosomes is your mom's chromosome and your dad's chromosome. And what you did in meiosis one is cut them up and paste them together. So you don't have exactly the same chromosomes that your parents, that your grandparents had. And your kids will not inherit exactly the same chromosomes that you got from your mom and dad. Uh, the chromosomes get, you could think of it as kind of a shuffling in meiosis one. And that's not something we see in mitosis. And then in my to my meiosis two is exactly like mitosis again. The chromosomes line up, they separate at the centromeres, and then each chromatid moves to opposite ends of the cell. This is in meiosis two. This would specifically be anaphase two, because you can see the chromosomes caught in the act of pulling apart. That's a very nice anaphase two. And then your end result is you end up with four cells, or in the case of eggs, one egg cell and a couple of polar bodies. Uh, this is what it looks like in lily flowers where they're making pollen, uh, but with some minor modifications, it would look the same in uh, the seminiferous tubules of testicles. And then in testicles, each one of these would break away and grow a little tail and develop a few more structures and get ready to launch. Okay, Tyler, does that do it? You there? Do I need to go back? We're at 10.53. I know. Um, I'll let you know. No worries. Okay, well, I knew. Okay, Tyler says you're good. Okay, Logan, you can slip out of here and I'm going to stop uh, recording.